Good morning, Young at Heart class. I'm so glad that you're watching this morning. I miss all of you and look forward to when we can come together again and be together in fellowship and go eat fish at Fairfield. It's good to see you. I hope that you are well and that you have been safe. And this morning, our class comes from the title is the great, we're, talk, we're studying the greatest week in history. I'm on lesson four, Shall I Crucify Your King? And so I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles with me and follow along all the way. I'm in John chapter 18, beginning at verse 39. We will study through John chapter 19, verse 16. So it'll be John chapter 8, 39 through John chapter 19, verse 16. Um, before we begin this morning, I'd like for us to uh, remember those that are sick and who need our prayers. Faith Beeman is continuing to recovery. We pray for that young lady that uh, she will recover and be back with us soon. Uh, also, uh, Darlene Olson, she's home recovering. And Darlene, we pray continually for your good health. <clears throat> Nancy Armstrong, we're praying for you, the stress that you're under with Gerald in the nursing home. Uh, don't forget that Carolyn Bennett will have a heart valve replacement on May the 7th. Uh, so keep her in your prayers. Pray for her doctors and nurses as they take care of her. Uh, Martha Olson's niece, Joella, finished her second round of chemo and uh, she is doing well, but please continue to pray for her. Uh, we have so many with health issues, Anita Hawkins and Helen Strange and Ruth Ann Watson and Rita Domini. Please pray for them. Tanya Rowden will have back surgery soon. I don't know the exact date yet. She has to be cleared by her heart doctor. And so, Tanya, we're all thinking about you and praying for you and Larry. Uh, also, remember all those going through cancer treatments, uh, such a horrible disease, and it it has such an impact on the entire family. So let's pray for all of those going through cancer treatments. Pray for those in the nursing homes and shut-ins. I'd like to mention uh, those this morning. Melba and Eleanor Bauer, Jewel Rutherford, Jean Wardlaw, Gerald Armstrong, Eula Henry, and then our shut-ins are Russell Bankus, Royce Bunch, Anita Hawkins, Jan Sane, Madeline, Madeline Berry, and Ruth Klein, Eula and Henry Parrish, and Bera White. Um, please pray for all these as uh, this week and every day of this week, and we pray for their good health. The greatest week in history. As Christians, we always, we always remember the cross of Jesus Christ. And we always remember that great sacrifice that He made for us. And we hold that close to our hearts and remember how much He suffered for us and how much He died for us. And we remember this every Lord's Day. We remember that he rose also from the grave and conquered death and is in heaven and his, a home is being prepared for his faithful. We're so thankful for that. We're thankful for what he went through for you and I so that we could have a home in heaven. Today, oh, I want us to look at a different aspect that, that really adds to Jesus' cross. And that is, I wanted us to, to, to study what kind of condition Jesus was in on the way to the cross. And I know most of you know this. I, uh, I, some things I have overlooked because I was solely concentrating on the cross. So the Jewish leaders are, are, are afraid of the people. Pilate is afraid of the Jewish leaders. But remember this, Jesus 
is afraid of no one, no one. Pilate's decision will come down to choosing between what he knows is right and risking his career possibly or doing what's wrong by compromising his values and the justice system that the Romans had. If you think about this, this is still the same decision that every person has to make today. Pilate had to make the decision, what do I do with Jesus? And we face that in our lives today. All of us must make that decision, what do I do with Jesus? Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. He's trying and trying to, to get out of this. Uh, he knows the situation that he's in. He understands, look, this is the situation I'm in, and I understand it, that it's a Jewish leader's maneuver. They want Jesus Christ killed. So Pilate finds himself over a political barrel. He's over the barrel. Pilate's first proposal then is in John chapter 18, verse 39 and 40, if you'll turn there with me. John 18, beginning at verse 39. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas, it says was a robber. He used this normal, Pilate did, this normal yearly concession that he made with the Jews that Rome would always release someone to the Jews during the Passover week. So Pilate thought the Jewish leaders would choose Jesus. That's what he thought. He did not have any idea. He did not think their hate would be this bad. Look at the choice the Jewish leaders made. It's really sad. The choice they made. Here's this murderer, an insurrectionist, and criminal. This man was certainly a threat to Rome. And not only was he a threat to Rome, he's even a threat to the to the Jewish people and the peace that they had. And so the, the Jews are going in their mind is so full of hate for Jesus that Pilate is, is just amazed. He didn't think they would ever select Barabbas over Jesus who had done nothing. He had done nothing guilty of death. And in, so in my mind, Pilate is just amazed with the Jewish leaders. They chose to release Barabbas. This is evil and hate at its worst, isn't it? It's evil and hate since Pilate knows that he is innocent. When you think about this, the Jewish leaders accused Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, of being an insurrectionist because they're using the Romans and they got to punch their buttons. They're using him as being an insurrectionist, and so now they're choosing a convicted insurrectionist to be set free, who is a criminal and a murderer. And the Jews are trying to say that Jesus is the cause of a revolution. He could be the cause of a revolution. Instead, they're going to release a guy who is so that they can punish a man who's innocent. This is a classic example of a choice we have today, isn't it? We have a choice between what's best and what's good and what's right in Jesus Christ or to reject Him for a life of the world, evil and sin. And many today have taken that course it's so sad that many times man will choose evil and darkness and guilt over Jesus Christ our Savior, but it happens every single day. So let's look at Pilate's second proposal. Pilate's second proposal is, let's, I'll have him scourged. 
Now let's look at John chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, the Jewish leaders, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate said to him, Behold this man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And we'll pick up at verse 7 here in a moment. Pilate makes this offer now he, th he thinks the time is right now. And surely he's saying to himself, surely when the Jews see how brutal and how he is beaten, it'll be enough to satisfy him. Scourging or flogging is far more brutal and horrible than you and I can imagine. And we're going to look at that this morning. The Roman scourge was made of a wooden handle that was usually wrapped in leather so the Roman soldier could hold it in his hand with a long brad or a braided strands of leather attached to the end of the handle. And on the end of the handle were woven into the straps or the strands sharp bits of bone or pieces of metal and what it was designed to do is literally shred the flesh with sharp bits of bone and metal that would just tear away at the flesh. Then the flesh would come from the body and be torn away. And history tells us, the Romans tells us in history, that many times this method of punishment exposes the spine, the ribs, and sometimes even the eternal organs. It was brutal. Remember in verse 1 we read, Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. Listen, this punishment was horrible and beyond our imagination for punishment. It's brutal and it's bloody. I, I want you to look at something that took me years to understand, I, I don't know if I if I just if I didn't understand it, or I just you know it's in my study. I just passed over it, going to Isaiah fifty three that we all know so well. So I want you to turn back with me to Isaiah fifty three. Isaiah fifty three. In Isaiah fifty three. We all know this so well, the suffering of Jesus on the cross, the griefs that he bore, the sins that he bore for us, and we all know it so well. I, I don't know what happened to me in Isaiah 52. When I'd study, I guess I, I, I didn't make the connection. And so I want you to look closely at Isaiah 52, verse 13 and 14. Behold, my servant will prosper. Jesus is the servant here. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than any than the sons of men. I don't know why I didn't see that or notice it or pay attention closer to that. This this leads up to Isaiah 53 that we all know. The servant here is Jesus. Now, now, do you see that? His appearance after the flogging by Pilate. He is disfigured beyond any human being, he says. 
His feed, his his features were disfigured by this flogging. He was beaten and left with features beyond any human man who has had this beating before. My lens. My goodness. I don't know why I failed to understand this completely. I, I, I've been a Christian many, many, many years. He was beaten and left in a worse condition in terms of his physical appearance than anyone who had ever been left in that condition. It goes on to say that his form was marred beyond any human likeness. He didn't look like himself. The Romans used the whip and it was designed with the purpose of shredding flesh and history tells us that your face, your back, your chest, your sides, your arms, and your legs all received this, this bitter punishment. Listen to me. The beating that Jesus took from this left him hardly recognizable. And he's going to take that with him to the cross. He's going to carry that cross. Pilate wanted him beaten, but he did not want him killed. And the reason is, is so when he brought him back out, the Jews would have compassion and they'd say, this is enough. It's why he did this. Pilate did not did this to satisfy the Jews because he knows that Jesus is innocent and Pilate is trying to evade doing what is right. In verse 4, Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So he's going to bring out Jesus Christ, our Savior, looking like this, with a crown of thorns that was on his head. You know they didn't just put it on there lightly. They slammed it into his head and twisted it. Blood was everywhere. And he's wearing a purple robe that was covered with blood. Pilate brings him out and says, Behold this man. He's hoping the Jews would say, Oh my, oh my, this is worse than I thought. Or I didn't know that it would be this bad. But that's not what happened. Have you ever wondered why? It's because Satan is involved in this 100%. This is why there is no compassion. They only want more blood. You take a look at their heart, and it's hard enough that they could look at Jesus, who's almost unrecognizable, that doesn't really look like him anymore and they don't feel for him they say killing crucify him crucify him Pilate said you take him yourself and crucify him in verse 7 the Jews answered we have a law of oh, really and by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Most of us have been through a lot of things in our life. We've seen a lot of things. We've been through a lot of things. And it's never been nothing compared to what Jesus suffered here and the cross. When even be the tip of Jesus' finger. And I would like to think that 
not one of us would have wanted to be there and to see all this or be involved. Pilate is afraid. He's in a panic. Look at John chapter 19 beginning at, at verse 8. Just read 8 through 11. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me. Do you not know I have the authority to release you and I have the authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who has delivered me to you has the greater sin. Pilate asked Jesus, Where are you from? Listen, he's not asking for his address. Jesus doesn't say a word to him. Remember, even Pilate having the pressure even of his own household, Pilate's wife warned him, have nothing to do with this just or innocent man. I have suffered much in a dream about him. Pilate says, you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know the power that I have? Don't you know my authority I have over you? And Jesus told him, you'd have no power. No power at all unless it was given to you by my Father in verse 11. And then he ends verse 11 with saying, For the reason he who delivered me to you has the greatest sin. From this time on, Pilate tries to set Jesus free. Let's look at verses 12 through 15. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, If you release this man, you are no longer a friend of Caesar. See, they're pushing his buttons as a Roman. Everyone who <clears throat> makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down at the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew called Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover and it was about the sixth hour. And, the, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Oh my. Pilate, in, in our words, <laughs> I'll just let him go. This man is totally innocent. And the Jewish leaders come back to Pilate and said, if you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar, who is Pilate's boss. And the Jews said, you have no king but Caesar. Now, Pilate's over a barrel here. The Jews are punching the right button. Pilate already had been reprimanded by Caesar for his treatment or complaints of the Jewish leaders. So in our words, you represent Caesar. Stand up for Caesar as the only king. And now, will you not kill him? You know, the, the truth is the Jews hated Caesar. They hated the Romans. But the Jewish leaders, by saying this, they, they even unintentionally told the truth, didn't they? They did not accept 
God is their king. They did not accept Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as their king. The Jews even said in Matthew 27 and verse 25, let his blood be on us and on our children. Can you imagine a statement like that? It's hard to believe that they could say that. Verse 13. Again, therefore when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. So Pilate finally mocks justice, doesn't he? He sells out. Verse 14 and 15 again. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate says, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered again to remind you, We have no king but Caesar. The only real truth that the Jews said this day They're really saying that God is not our king. The Jews hated Rome. They hated Pilate. They hated Caesar. But they hated Jesus Christ more. What do you... You know, you want it. You you just can't hardly believe they would act this way. You want to think about this and... And you look at this and you say, when God's people said to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar, it's a wishy-washy political statement. But there's something deeper here with the hearts of men. These are God's chosen people. Jesus is standing right in front of them the Son of God who created this universe that we live in. They're really saying that God is not our King. What about our Heavenly Father that has been their King for the last 2,000 years? He's the one that brought them out of Egypt, crossed over the Red Sea, provided them food, water, and shelter the whole time, brought them to the promised land, and on and on you could go and just look at the hypocrisy. Sad, isn't it? Verse 16, So he handed him over to them, which is the Roman soldiers, to be crucified. Matthew 27 and verse 26 says, Then he released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. In Matthew 27, 24, we even see Pilate washing his hands before the crowd. What a coward's gesture. So in fear, he hands Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to crucify him. So I want to finish today's class with these thoughts for us. As despicable and as sickening as this is, even Pilate mocking justice, trying to wash his hands of the guilt, it's cowardice and it's full of fear inside him and the Jews' unwillingness to do the right thing. No fair trial. They just want him dead. And God is in control of all of this. God's will is going to be accomplished He sent His Son into this world to go through everything that we've talked about so far. Jesus volunteered to come here. He knew what kind of death and what kind of torture, what kind of a a beating, what kind of a death He was going to face. And He knew that He was going to die for you 
and for me so that we could be saved by his blood. A one-time sacrifice to end all sacrifices for man. You know, you, you think about this. How many people have stood in the shoes where the Jews and Pilate stood? There have been many in this world we live in. We've all heard sermons from preachers from for the last 50 years of what am I going to do with Jesus, but a, a truer statement could not be made. It's an answer to the question the way Jesus deserves it. There's no bigger question in this life. Wherever we are, wherever, wherever we are from, we have to decide about Jesus Christ and there's no way that we're going to wiggle out of it like Pilate of this decision. We all have to make it. We must make this decision as an individual. We can't do it as a group. We make it on an individual basis. We obey Jesus Christ by believing in Him and repenting of our sins and confessing that He is the Christ, the Son of God, and being baptized for the remission of our sins and then go and live a faithful life to Him each and every day of our life. And we have the promises from God for a home in heaven. Or do we make the other choice? Do we choose to lose our soul, to live a life in this world of sin and darkness? I guess, well, without a doubt, that's not no guessing to it. Without a doubt, there's no bigger question in this life. We all get caught up in this world, don't we? Every one of us, we all do. We always are thinking about stuff and things. We think we have control of our life and how much house can I afford and when can I buy a new car and how much money in the bank do I have? But there's coming a time when none of this is going to matter. It'll all be gone. You see, we're only temporary here. We're only temporary. And all the time we live here on this earth, it is for the purpose of answering this question. What do I do with Jesus Christ? Where do I want to spend an eternity in heaven or living eternal hell. You know, I think since this virus has, has hit this world, I guess if you could take one positive out of it, I don't know. It's so hard to do, isn't it? Except we know still that God is in control. But there's something else that's kind of come to our face. That all the world's stuff and things are not quite as important to us anymore. We realize that we could die. We realize it's all in God's hand and we must be prepared in our life. So what really matters is how do we answer this question? What do we do with Jesus? He is the only way for forgiveness. He is the only way that we are redeemed by the blood of His cross. The longer we put off this decision, the easier it is. The more and more callous we become. But sooner or later, we will answer. You know, if
it was quite a price, wasn't it, that Jesus paid for us, for our life here on this earth. He paid the price for our sins. And sometimes we forget about this flogging. We forget how terrible and painful and bloody that it was. And he brings him out in front of the Jews with the purple robe and a crown of thorn, thorns that had been smashed into his head and blood is everywhere. And they yell, crucify him, crucify him. And he carries that wooden cross in that type of a condition all the way. Except Simon carried it some of the way. And he was laid down on that cross. Nails driven through his hands and feet. And raised and lifted up for us. As a one-time sacrifice, He voluntarily gave His life for us. Next Sunday, or Sunday, next Tuesday, we're going to talk about the cross. And I titled the lesson, It is Finished. I hope that you will join me next Tuesday at 10 o'clock. It's been so good studying with you. I know all of this means so much to you and me. And we'll talk to you again next Tuesday morning.